I wanted to get into a sermon tonight that I call a rock and a hard place. Has anybody ever been caught between a rock and a hard place besides me? You know, that's kind of like the nature of life. That sometimes is the way we find ourselves in situations and you just wonder which way you can move, how you can turn, what are you going to do? And so one of the great, great stories of the Bible illustrates that principle very, very well. And that is the nation of Israel, which is a type of the church. We know that the Old Testament contains the stories of Israel as the chosen people of God, and they are. But then beyond that, that blessing and that, that uh, uh, destiny has been passed into the church through Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says if you're a believer but not a Jew, you are a child of Abraham because you're a child by faith in God. And so I'm thrilled tonight that I've been grafted in to what God is doing according to Romans, and so have you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But this story is so incredible of Israel passing through the Red Sea and how that they were stuck in a tough situation between, as it were, a rock and a hard place, and they really had nowhere to go. But I remember seeing this as a kid. I remember being asked by someone if I wanted to go see the Ten Commandments in the movie theater. And, and Cecil B. DeMille was the director And I was so excited to go, because back then, you know, you didn't have movies everywhere. You didn't go to movies all the time. That was 100 years ago. How many know that? Come on, are you out there? And so, you know, and I I went to the movie theater with friends of mine in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. Okay, and so we went there, and it's down on the main street. And the movie theaters closed up a long time ago down there. All the big metroplexes put them out of business. But that's where I saw it. And I I remember seeing uh, Charlton Heston up on that rock with that rod, you know, and the clouds swirling behind him. Come on, how many have ever seen that movie? That's a classic, right? The, The Ten Commandments. And had all these interesting people. I think it was Edward G. Robinson was the, like one of the villains, you know, and all these people. Yul Brenner was, was uh, you know, the Pharaoh. And it was a really interesting production and a beautiful story, really. Very well done for that time and day. And I remember, you know, got my popcorn ready, you know. Come on, how many got your popcorn? And, of course, I have to also have my chocolate-covered peanuts because you just can't get the full anointing with popcorn alone. Are you with me, people? So I got my popcorn on one hand. I got my chocolate-covered peanuts. Now, this was the days before special effects, digital, computer graphics, all that stuff. This was not computer-generated. This was done in a different kind of day and time before all of that came around. And and so I'm sitting there, and Moses got his back to the sea, you know, the Red Sea, and all the people are there, and they're afraid. And here comes Pharaoh's armies. Uh, Oh, man, it's a dramatic moment. It's a great, great story. And the Lord instructs Moses what to do. And man, Moses takes that, holds that rod up over the water. And he says, stand still and see the salvation of God. And right down the middle of that sea, that water splits. And that was back before, like I said, they had computer generated stuff. But I'll tell you right now, my popcorn went flying one way and my peanuts went the other way. I mean, when I saw that thing split, I went, whoa. It was so incredible to know that God has that kind of power. And so I think this story is so fantastic because it's so relevant to every person within the sound of my voice. If you're listening on the internet and you're you're plugged into this, you're going to be able to apply this to your life as well. Because here's what I'm trying to tell you guys. Every one of us, one way or another, finds ourselves with the back against the wall sometime. Sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where you can't really move left, you can't move right, you can't go forward, and you can't go backward, and you're between a rock and a hard place. And so tonight, I want to focus on that phenomenon and that circumstance so that if you find yourself in one, maybe God can give us some answers and some inspiration as to what to do. And so I want to go to the uh, book of Exodus tonight. My question to all of you guys is, have you ever been stuck in that kind of a circumstance. Maybe you're there right now. I I, I put a big word in my notes, and it just says trapped, question mark. Are you trapped? Has anybody besides, besides me ever felt that way, where you just didn't know what you could do? And you know what? In God, there's always something you can do. But we have to be reminded of that. Whenever the things, the enemy's staring you down, which is what was happening in this story, when the sea is behind you and there's nowhere you can turn, you have to be reminded of what God can do. 
But here's what I have found. Sometimes these situations that we find ourselves in are very enlightening. They bring a certain clarity to us. How many know what a pressure cooker is? Pressure cooker. You know, I I personally like pressure cookers because when I hear that thing rattling on top, I know I'm about to eat and I'm a fan. Come on, how many are a fan of, yeah, dinner, lunch, bright, whatever. And I know we got that pressure cooker thing going on. And, and, and the, the, sometime when you get in those circumstances, that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like a pressure cooker. If you're alive tonight, you know what I'm talking about. You know about the pressure cooker that sometimes you find yourself in and you're getting stewed alive. But listen, listen, if you're feeling pressure, I want you to hear this. Pressure also produces diamonds from coal. Pressure sometimes makes something fabulously valuable out of something that otherwise would be pretty much worthless. Irritations produce valuable, expensive pearls. Say, man, I'm getting irritated right now. I mean, I'm working with this guy, and he's an irritant in my life. You talk about a thorn in my side. Ladies and gentlemen, that's God producing a wonderful value within your life. Sometimes God will let those things buffet us and bump up against us so that we develop that sense of value before God, and there's a refining going on. As a matter of fact, gold is purified, but only over very high heat. If you want to come forth like silver and gold, sometime you got to be able to endure the heat. It's the process of God to bring the best out of you. It's the process of God to see what's inside of you. It reveals what you're made of. And so God is working hard to get rid of all the waste and all the dross. He's trying to get rid of the things that 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 maybe affect you in a negative way so that the shining beauty of God's glory can come out of your life. Please say amen. So I want to read a few verses in Exodus 14. Please look at Exodus 14 with me. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pehahatharoth between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, and that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Has anybody ever been chased by the enemy? You know, we have an enemy of our souls. The Bible talks about the old serpent. The Bible talks about Satan. The Bible talks about Lucifer falling from heaven. These spiritual realms are very, very real. They're not a figment of somebody's imagination. People like to tell you all you see is all you get. All this stuff, this natural world is everything there is. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff in my own life, let alone others, that I've had happen to me that could not be explained in any way, shape, or form by natural law or natural phenomenon. There's a spirit realm that's more real than this temporary natural physical realm. Please say amen on that one as well. We've got to establish this in our hearts. And so God is often doing something in the spirit realm, and we have an enemy who will resist us. The Bible says Satan withstood him. And so there are times whenever Satan and his minions will come and try to limit what positive things God will do in your life. He will try to talk you out of them. He will try to pressure you out of them. He will try to irritate you out of them. But remember, if you walk in the grace of God and the promises of the Lord, that stuff will work to bring value into your heart and to turn you into gold and silver and pearls and precious things. And I mean all of that, of course, figuratively. But ladies and gentlemen, how many know peace that passes understanding is more valuable than any gold. How many know that? I know people that have got gold bars. They've got diamond. They've got wealth. They've got big bank accounts. And they're upset. They're uptight. They're worried. They're nervous. They don't know where to turn to get peace. Well, I'm here to introduce anybody like that to someone I know very well. He happens to be called the Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus. Is there anybody that loves Jesus? Anybody besides me get some peace from Jesus? Come on, anybody? Come on, you're out there, right? And so I'm encouraging you to press into God. We need peace. And many times Satan will come and try to interfere. 
But aren't you glad the Bible says in Acts that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Ghost and, and, and power, who went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil? So many of these things come against us, and it's Satan working behind the scenes. If you reject that reality, you do so at your own peril. I'm simply telling you and declaring the truth of God's word. But here we find Israel, just like many of us, stuck in that hard place, not knowing where they could turn. It's interesting to read this because uh, it, it, it almost reminds me of some of the episodes I've had in my own life. Say amen, please. Come on, are you out there? And so I'm not, I'm looking at this, but, but the thing that stands out to me, and maybe you guys can get this as well, is God's not surprised by where you are. He wasn't surprised where they were. This didn't catch God off guard. As a matter of fact, if you read the scripture carefully that I just quoted, God's the one who told him to go there. Now let's say that again. God's the one who told him to go down through the desert a certain way, to go down by Pihahiroth, and go between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal, Zephon. That's where he told them to go. And he said, I want you to camp before and by the sea. So here they are in a tough situation, and it would appear by everything that I can understand that God's the one who put them there. Isn't it interesting that God might lead us into a situation where we would see the activity of the enemy. He would lead us into a position where the enemy would try to come up from our, 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 uh, the rear side of our campment to come in and slide in and try to intimidate us. Satan will work toward that goal in your family. Satan will work toward that goal in your job. Satan will work toward that, that goal in your mind and your thinking. Satan will work in these areas because he's the enemy of your soul. We have this opposite pulling on us, but God said, I am stronger, I am mightier, I am greater than all of those things. Greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. So don't get too nervous, but be vigilant, be sober, because your adversary goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Notice the Bible says may devour. He may not devour me in the name of Jesus. You only can be devoured if you give him permission. Say amen, please. And so why would God lead these people here? Why would he lead them here? And really, in part, he tells us. There's a several aspects to this, but in part, he tells us. Because he says in that last verse of our scripture reading, I will gain honor over the enemy. My name will be lifted. I will show the Egyptians who God is. He says, I'm going to put you in a situation where the enemy is going to come. Because Pharaoh will say, they're bewildered by the land. They're lost. The wilderness has trapped them. They don't know where they're going. Here they are stuck against the sea. They are sitting ducks. But how many know, in Jesus, you're never a sitting duck. Say amen, please. You never. It looks like there's nowhere to turn. And all of a sudden, God makes a way where there is no way. Come on. And the doctors say, well, I don't know what I can do for you. You're in bad shape. But God makes a way where there is no way. The boss calls you and says, well, we're going to have to demote you. You're going to lose some of your income. But the Bible says God will make a way where there is no way. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling some joy tonight. Because I remind myself when I talk like this of the time that God has helped me in tough situations. And miraculously, he turns Turn the table on the devil. He can do the same thing for you. In fact, you know what? It may appear that you're lost and confused. It may appear that way. I mean, Pharaoh's going to, he's going to bring that kind of thinking to that situation. And maybe when you get in tough situations, you don't always know the answers. Maybe when you get in a tough trap-like situation, you don't know what to do. I'm honest enough to say I've been in circumstances where I had to pray and pray and pray just to figure out what to do next. I've been in situations that perplexed my, my mind and they, they, they worked with my head and they made me spin just a little bit and I had to really press into God. But you know what? The Holy Spirit's faithful. The Holy Spirit will show you. The Holy Spirit will give you a word of knowledge, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit will give you a word of wisdom. Say amen, please. We like people to talk back in our church. That's why I always say, you don't have to, but I love to hear a little bit coming back. And so here's what I'm saying. I'm saying rely on God because he is at work in these circumstances. 
Here's a verse for you. Do you guys believe this verse? Hebrews 13, 5. Listen, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you believe that? If you turn your heart over to Jesus, he's with you, man. The Bible says in, in Proverbs 18, 24, that a friend, Jesus, sticks closer than your own brother. Wow. How I many know you can't always depend on your family? You might have a great family. Maybe you don't have such a great family. Sometimes your extended family may have a few rebels in there. Come on. This is real. This is real preaching. This is real life. I'm not trying to paint a fairy tale. This isn't some kind of a sitcom where everybody gets along real good. The reality is that sometimes even your family will let you down. But Jesus is a brother. He sticks close to you, man. He never leaves. He's with you. I don't know where you're at right now. But this preacher's telling you tonight, God's with you. Jesus is with you. He's walking alongside of you. And I love that little poem that shows that sometimes he carries us. Come on. How many have been carried by God at times? He either had to pick you up and actually log you along here in order for you to make your way. So here's what I want to say to you. Trust in the Lord. Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. He, capital H. God delights in the way that you're walking. He delights in the fact that you're following his voice. He loves it if he tells you to go down through the desert and go down past that city and get down there along the sea between Migdal and the ocean. He loves it when we obey him. Even when we get down there and we start looking around thinking, man, what am I doing here? Why am I in this situation? Why am I in this hospital room? I don't know what's happening. Why am, I, why am I sitting in this lawyer office? Why am I down here with this counselor at this school down here for one of my kids? What is going on? Why would that happen? But you know what? God is a master at turning negatives into positives. He's a master of turning the tables on the devil. And you know what? You might as well get ready because I'm going to get a little bit excited before this is over with. You might as well fasten your spiritual seatbelt because I'm feeling this tonight. Because you know what? I know I'm connecting with somebody. It reminds me of John, the ninth chapter, where his disciples came to Christ. The blind man was standing there. And they said, why was this man born blind? Was it because of the sins that he committed? Or was he born blind because of the sins his parents committed? See, we're always looking for a negative answer to everything. We're always taking that negative posture. That's the wrong question. Jesus said, neither. But I'm going to look at this. And you know, Jesus forever showed us how to look at a bad situation. Watch. He said, this man was born this way so that the works of God could be revealed in him. Amen. If you've got a negative thing in your life, don't ask questions about where it come from. Where it, it's okay to look at your life. It's okay to examine it. But you know what? A lot of people get caught up in some sort of a, 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 you know, some kind of digital loop and they never get out of it where they just talk themselves into being completely depressed. But Jesus said, I'm not looking, I'm, we're not going to define it that way. We're not going to look at it that way. We're going to look at it as an opportunity for God to receive glory. So that he can be established as the great and mighty father, the great and mighty master, the one who's the healer and deliverer. And the only reason why God is looking for that is so that we will have a good perspective about how we fit into this picture and who we really are in Christ. And God is lifting his people. God is elevating his people. He elevates us so much that the Bible says as a believer in Jesus, you're seated in heavenly places with Christ, spiritually speaking. And so that's what God is looking to do. So if you got something in your life you're battling right now, you got something coming against you, you got the enemy showing their ugly face, listen, I've got news for you. You are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. And God is just setting you up so that his works can be revealed in your life. And there's no doubt from the scriptures, we're going to read another verse right now, that the enemy looks impressive. Verse 10 says, when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them so that they were very afraid. You're talking about choice chariots, 600, plus all the rest of the chariots of the army. You're talking about thousands upon thousands upon thousands of soldiers in full armament coming with their weapons drawn. You're talking about an impressive enemy. And you know what? The enemy does look impressive. I already told you he goes around like a roaring lion. Have you ever seen a lion let loose with a roar? It's impressive. 
But you know what? Jesus, through the power of his sacrifice, Jesus, through the power of his blood, has detoothed the devil. So he may roar like a, a, a roaring lion. He may make a lot of noise. He may even look a little grand standing up there, opening his mouth and uttering what he utters. But ladies and gentlemen, he has been taken down a number of notches, and the Satan is a defeated foe. we got to settle it in our hearts that we are the victors through Christ who loves us. Please, somebody say amen on that one. And so there's no doubt, you get in these circumstances, and man, you see that, you see the enemy coming. Sometimes the enemy is embodied in some kind of a problem. Sometimes the enemy is some kind of discord in your family. Sometimes the enemy is some kind of disease or infirmity. Sometimes the enemy might be somebody who's been treating you wrong and ripping you off. But ladies and gentlemen, that person cannot steal your joy if your hope is in Jesus. That person cannot take you places you don't want to go if you're walking in the Holy Ghost. God can break that thing off of your life, break a chain, break a fetter, break those things that are binding you. He can set you free to praise him. He can set you free to rejoice. Pretty soon you're going to be doing the Holy Ghost step, the boogaloo and the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. And so you need to, anybody know what the boogaloo is? It just shows how old I am, man. Come on, the boogaloo, yeah, the boogaloo, right? Okay, so God is calling his people to be a celebratory and to believe God. The other thing I see is God is interested in us not turning back. Amen. Notice in the first verse, now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pihahithroth and the, between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal Zephron. But he told them to turn. And that's true. When they came out of Egypt, they had to turn right and go down along the, the, the shore there. That's where they had to go. So God wanted them to turn just like God wants us to turn. God wanted them to turn from that way that they had learned in Egypt. God wanted them, the Bible uses a word, the word is repent. It means to change directions. It means to make a turn, a dramatic turn in your life. It means to change your mind, the way you've been thinking, the way you've been living, the way you've been acting, and you turn. That's what God told them to do. Come out of Egypt. I'm going to set you free from this bondage and slavery you've been in all these hundreds of years. And I want you to come out of Egypt and turn. But don't turn around once you get your head of steam up. Once you're headed in the right direction, Satan will try to turn you around. Verse 11 and 12, are you ready? Then they said to Moses, because they saw what was happening. Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? How many know they had the gift of sarcasm? I love sarcasm, actually. I'm always that way. I'm, I'm, you know, Facebook, I'm always sarcastic. Just a little bit, though. I try to be polite. Sarcasm makes an interesting point. Why have you dealt with us, they said this way? To bring us up out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt? We told you, let us alone. That we may serve the Egyptians. We want to stay slaves. We want to stay in bondage. We want to stay here. Because we're comfortable. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm warning you, don't get too comfortable in that negative circumstance you're in. But look to God to change it. Look to God to give you a turn. But they said, oh, we want to stay there. For it would have been better, they said, for us to stay and serve the Egyptians than that we would, should die in the wilderness out here, Moses. What's the matter with you? You know, we get trapped, you know. When you get trapped in a circumstance, sometimes there's a tendency to complain. I know you guys never do it, but I have. Yeah, get trapped in a circumstance where you don't know which way you can go. Sometimes we start complaining. Start, we blame the leader. We blame the guy who's, you know, working in our lives to try to get us someplace. And that's the person we turn on. You know, it's like a dog that's hurt bites the person trying to help him. And sometimes we got that kind of a spirit. I've seen that in the church. It's a sad day. I've seen it on the job. I've seen it in circumstances in schools and education. I've seen it in families where somebody will turn on somebody else. We get trapped. We turn into a different person. We get in a situation where we're uncomfortable. We, we start thinking, whoa, it was way better back there. The grass is not greener on the other side of the fence. But ladies and gentlemen, if you're in bondage and you're in slavery, can we just settle it? That's not a good place to be. You need to have enough courage. You have enough boldness to step out of that and to boldly step forward into a freedom and a liberty that only God can give you. Oh, hallelujah. 
So I want to encourage you guys tonight. I want to encourage you guys tonight to trust in the Lord. Don't make a U-turn. If you haven't turned to the Lord, yes, make a U-turn. God allows U-turns. But if you're on a head of steam following after God, if you're following after Jesus, if you're on a walk of faith and you know God's got the sail and the wind behind you, and you know that even though the devil's trying to resist you, that you're blessed of the Lord, and you're blessed going in, and you're blessed coming out, you're blessed above, and you're blessed beneath, and you're blessed in the country, and you're blessed in the city, isn't that what the Bible says? If you know that, then don't turn around. Don't give up. Hang in there. Exodus 14, 13, 14. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Moses starts speaking in the promise of God. Listen, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. I like that kind of talk. I like that kind of faith attitude. I like somebody who'll get up and say, you know what? Stand still and get ready because God's going to blow you away. Get ready because you're going to receive an, a, a, a blessing you will not be able to contain. God can do these things, ladies and gentlemen. He went on and said, for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. How many believe God can blow the enemy away in your life? How many believe God can deal with the disease and the problem and the depression and the conflict? How many believe God can do it in the name of Jesus? Is anybody believing with me tonight that God is able? God is able. I said God is able. And you know what I want to say to the church? Don't try to get off cheap. You know, I'm sad that there are a lot of people who don't want to pray if it's not them in need of prayer. I'm sad that some people don't want to receive the word if it's not something that speaks directly to them. I'm sad that sometimes people miss the whole point. You ought to be focused on what God is saying tonight. You ought to be focused on praying for others. You ought to be focused on believing for somebody else because that's when God can bless you the most is when you're concerned about someone else. Say amen, please. I'm challenging you tonight. I'm a challenger. I think of myself as a non-wimpy preacher. I don't always get it right, but at least I give it to you wide open. Come on, somebody. And you notice he's talking about this in the 14th verse. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. In other words, he says, just calm down and relax. God's on your side. God will fight for you. I don't know about you, but I'm sure glad whenever my big older brother shows up. I'm looking down the face of some kind of enemy, and here he comes. It's like tag team. I tag Jesus and step out of the way. Boom. He takes over. Anybody love tag team spirituality? Come on. Let God do it. Let God step in. And he's speaking future tense. It hasn't happened yet. All they're looking at is a nasty situation where they got the back against the wall and an ugly enemy out here, and they got hills on either side. They cannot get out. But remember, the hills on their side also kept the enemy from coming around to get them. Sometimes those things that look like barricades to your progress are really God defending you against the enemy. Think about that for a minute. I said, think about that for a minute. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something else. He's talking future tense. You know why? Because the process many times takes time. If you look at the scriptures, it says that it was all that night, all that night that the cloud of God that had been leading them came around. Do you remember the cloud of God was leading them? It was a fire at night, and it was a cloud by day. And when they got pinned against the sea, the cloud came around the angel of the Lord and stood between them and the enemy. That cloud represents the presence of God. But the Bible says it took all night. And I don't know about you, but I've really been in some long nights. I've been through some long night seasons. It seemed like the sun quit moving. I've been stuck in some dark places sometimes. And I'm wondering, where is the light of God? I'm looking. I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen next. When is the sun going to rise? Tears may endure for the night, the Bible says, but joy comes in the morning. But where's the morning? Where's the break? The reality is this is a part of our life, and we have to be patient when we see God processing, when we see God moving. We've got to trust in him. Aren't you glad, though, in those nighttime hours that the presence of God is with you? 
Aren't you glad when you're facing down the enemy, you'll always have the presence of God? Remember, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Isn't that the promise? Somebody right now needs to apply that to your life. You need to say, you know what? I've been beat up. I've been pushed around. But I'm stopping right now and thanking God for the presence of the Holy Ghost. The cloud of God is in front of me. And it's protecting me from the onslaught of the enemy. And I'm coming out of this a victor. I'm coming out of this more than a conqueror. I'm coming out of this with a high hand, strong and bold in Jesus. If you're that person, say amen tonight. Do you ever find yourself in the nighttime waiting for the daylight? Does it feel really, really, really long? Yes. But you've got to rely on the presence of God. You've got to rely on the presence of God. And remember, the Bible says, if you read the Scripture, and I don't have it, I'm not going to read it right now. You can read that when you get home. But it says that the cloud during the night was light to one side and darkness to the other side. Guess which side the light had? Come on. I think that's a no-brainer because the Bible says in the Psalms, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And so all night, the enemy was in darkness, utter darkness. But all night, with all of that hanging on their head, with everything that they were being impinged upon, they had the light of God's presence shining and the fire was burning bright. Hallelujah. I'm praying for that in your lives right now. God, let your light shine upon every one of us in Jesus' name. So the presence of God, yes, the enemy's out there, but the presence of God is always in the picture, protecting you and shining the light on you. And I want to say this as a declaration. I want to just declare according to Scripture, the resurrection power of God is working in your body right now. The resurrection power is working in your spirit right now. Because the Bible says a great promise, the same power. Everybody say the same power. That raised Jesus from the dead shall also make alive and quicken your mortal body. How many know if you pinch yourself, that's your mortal body? The, the Spirit of God literally can make you alive. So the resurrection power is working in the church. The resurrection power is working in families. The resurrection power is working in your life right now. You say, Randy, I'm not perfect. Guess what? Neither am I. But through Jesus I am. Through the blood of Christ, I've been made perfect. And I have that portion of the Spirit because He has made me worthy to receive His power and His presence and His blessing. If you go back into chapter 13 in Exodus, just before all of this happened, you'll find out that God led them the long way around to get where they were. God does not guarantee He's going to do an instantaneous work. I like what the preacher says. We, you know, uh, we, we, we want a, ha- a microwave God, but we serve a crockpot God. How many know what I'm talking about? It takes a little time sometimes, and God will do that. But I see that in this story. He could have sent them quicker. He could have sent them quicker, but he didn't. He sent them the long way. And when they got there, they had to sit there with the enemy breathing down their neck all night. <laughs> or the new Facebook word, ugh. Have you seen that one? I never saw that before. Now I'm seeing everybody say, ugh. I don't know, U-G-H. I don't know what it means except, ugh. (laughs) I think that's probably what you'd say if you saw Pharaoh coming with us. You'd turn to everybody and say, ugh. You know, come on, are you out there, right? And then God steps into the situation. He says, lift up your rod, stretch your hand over the sea. And you know what happened? God's power hit that thing and turned the barrier that was pinning them in into the way of escape. He turned the barrier into a blessing. I said he turned the barrier into a blood. The thing that's impinging on you, the thing that's limiting you, God has the power to turn that into the blessing. Isn't that incredible? How many know only God? Wave your hand at me if you know only God can do that. Come on. Only God can do that. He can do that. I know I'm yelling. I know I'm shouting. I know I'm excited. I just am feeling a word tonight, and I know it's landing. I know it's doing something. I know it's pushing back darkness. I know it's, a, it's, it's separating that water from the water so that they could go over on dry land, and that's what's happening in your life. Grab a hold of this word. Believe in God. Jesus said, have faith in God, because he knew that's what would make all the difference. I'm going to finish this up. Hang on, people. But part of the question at least still remains, why would God bring them into a trap? I know he wants to get honor on the devil. What, 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 what does that mean? The depths of that really are a puzzle to, to me for a long time. 
And I was studying this and studying this, and I was looking at it, and I loved it, but I couldn't quite get my head around that. And then I started looking at the place where they were located before they crossed over through the dry land in the midst of the Red Sea. I started looking at these locations. Look at verse 2 again. Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before pi Hiroth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal, Zephon. That was the location. You shall camp before it by the sea. You'll camp in a trap. I want you to go into a place where the enemy can pin you in. When we know God would get honor out of it. But I thought to myself, what is that all about? And then I realized as I was looking at each one of those locations, Baal Zephon was located across the Red Sea. Now, this is a narrow part of the Red Sea, but across directly from where God told them to go was Baal Zephon, which was a mountain, which was a mountain. And it's called Baal Zephon because that means Lord or God of the north. It was the place where the uh, Ugarites, the Egyptians, and the Phoenicians, all mentioned in their writings, was their God that they served. The Egyptians had a holy place on that mountain. And not only that, but that God was known as the sea God. So they put him alongside the sea on that mountain to overwatch and overlook his sea. But how many know the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof? How many know that those false gods may stand around not saying anything, not doing anything because they're dumb and they're deaf, but they stand around and everybody bows down and honors them. But those gods have no power. They have no influence. And God took them to a specific location directly across from their God so he could show them who the real God was. Sometimes God gets us in a circumstance, we don't understand it and we don't like it. But he's setting this thing up to prove who really is God. He placed them directly across from there and then he said, kaboom. He said, you think, you think that Baal Zephon rules? Bam. Think again. And he split the ocean directly over to that mountain. And let the people walk over free. Then he turned the waters on their enemies and destroyed them. And the prophecy that Moses spoke by faith that they would see their enemies no more came to pass. I'm talking to somebody tonight who's been dealing with some enemies. Can I just say the same thing to you? God can take those enemies. He can drown them in the sea. And you will see them no more forever. Can I tell you that? Will you accept that if I tell you that? Can you believe? Can you have faith that God is and will do that? He was, he's able and will do it. I've got a few f- questions for you that you need really to ask. I'm just going to suggest them. How about heart problems? How about arthritis? How about cancer? How about diabetes? You think you rule over this body? That's what you need to say to the arthritis. You think you rule over this body? That's what you need to say to the heart problems and the cancer. That's what you need to say to diabetes. You think you rule over my body? Bam, God shows his power in your physical body, just like he did at Baal Zephon. He says the Red Sea does not belong to that false God. The Red Sea belongs to Jehovah. He belongs to the Lord God Almighty, and he proved it. Your body belongs to the Lord if you've turned him, it, your body over to him, if you turned your life to him. We're bought with a price. He owns us. That means he's going to do something to change your circumstance. How about this one? Depression, suicide, gender confusion. You think you rule over this mind of mine? God steps in. Boom. No. Just like Baal, this Zephon, just like that circumstance, he proves that he's God over your mind. We have the mind of Christ. How many tonight have the mind of Christ? Just wave your hand at me if you've got the mind of Christ. Come on. That's what we need to claim. That's what we need to proclaim. That's what we need to declare. That's what we need to believe. How about strife, contention, divorce, hatred? You think you rule over my family? Think again. 
God is the Lord of my family. God is God in my family. He's the Lord over me and my spouse and my kids. He's the Lord over our house. He's the Lord over our prosperity. He's God. You're not running this thing any more than those false gods did. How about sin, discouragement? How about failure in your life? You think that rules over your life? Think again. Your God is greater. Your God is stronger. Your God is mightier. Don't let those things embed themselves into your spirit. Don't let those things embed themselves into your thinking. Don't let them embed themselves into your habits. Don't let those things embed themselves into your mind. But let God reign. Let God rule. Stand back and watch what God can do. Come on, somebody. Give him praise tonight. Clap your hands and give God some praise tonight. Hallelujah. What do we learn? Very simple. God is God, and God is good. That's what we learn. Everybody stand up, please. God, we praise you tonight. We thank you. We thank you that through this traumatic story, this amazing incident, we have learned something, and that is that depression doesn't rule. Disease does not rule. Confusion does not rule. Suicide does not rule. Depression does not rule. Infirmities do not rule. Conflict does not rule. None of those false idols and gods contain any authority over us because we are the Lord's. We belong to him. We are part of his body. We've been baptized into his greatness. And God, I thank you that we carry around in us the blessing of the Lord.